hello, everybody. Um, thanks uh, so much for joining us uh, uh, today to talk a little bit about relational observability uh, for cloud native security and data science. Uh, my name is uh, Terrell, uh, and my colleague Fred, who called the the demo god, he's going to do some demonstrations uh, at the latter uh, half of the uh, the talk. Um, and again, we're going to talk about relational observability. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, we're actually um, both from IBM Research. Uh, we joined about, uh, about six and a half years ago, around the same time, with a passion for, for security. Um, we are um, uh, open source maintainers and contributors of two projects. Uh, one that we're going to talk about today, which is the, the Cisco Telemetry uh, project. Um, we're also uh, contributors and maintainers of certain projects for Falco security. Um, so uh, we're also present on, both of these communities have Slack channels. So if anybody's ever interested, uh, come say hello. Uh, we're happy to, uh, you know, to talk and collaborate with, with, with different folks um, on, on those avenues. Um, we're, again, both you know, security researchers. Um, we do a lot of work in cloud-based security um, uh, with focus on, on visibility, um, also um, in systems and software security. So we've actually done kind of met up uh, doing uh, some cyber deception research. Um, so that's a, that's a passion of both of ours. Um, and uh, and um, we're uh, a lot of, with this project, around security engineering um, and data, data science. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about runtime observability. Uh, what we mean by uh, runtime uh, observability is really sort of being able to get um, visibility into the workloads um, in our, in our systems, in our clouds, um, and being able to identify what's going on and what they're doing. And so we can do this in various ways. Um, the way that we, we do it here, and what we're, what we're talking about, is this idea of monitoring um, how a program interacts with its system through the, the system call layer. So we can monitor the various system calls, and this can tell us how a process interacts with the file system, how it interacts with the network, and how it interacts with other processes. Now, the challenge of recording uh, system calls is we typically do that between the user space and the kernel space. Um, and this can generate a lot of data uh, monitoring all of these calls. Um, and so it makes it very difficult to be able to do any analytics on it. Um, and so you get a lot of projects out there that do a lot of rule-based stuff on, on this type of data. Um, and um, it can be impossible to store and analyze. Uh, so the goal of of the Sysflow project um, is to enable data, data science on top of this type of telemetry. Uh, and we do this um, by focusing on data abstractions. So essentially taking all of this uh, chatty data and uh, you know, lifting it up into uh, beh behavioral uh, sort of telemetry stacks um, that allow us to do more analytics and store more state um, the, the higher we lift it. Um, and so through this, uh, we wanted to create a, an open stack for system security and, and data science through that. Uh, and so really uh, lo looking at this uh, picture here, we talk about this idea of multi-level data abstraction. We start with uh, the, the, the system calls um, at, the, at the sort of, I guess, the left part of your screen. Uh, and we can think about it as trying to, doing sort of this type of work as trying to put a grapefruit through a straw, as a colleague um, often says. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is you can either increase the straw size or you can shrink the grapefruit. And we're trying to, to shrink the grapefruit. Um, and we do this um, with different uh, data abstractions. One of them, which is called Sysflow, uh, is the idea of basically creating um, an object relational format that allows you um, to uh, show the behaviors of how processes are inter interacting with the system. Uh, Sysflow, um, uh, as we'll go into a little bit more detail in, in uh, later slides, is still a very sort of stateless uh, uh, type format, um, but we can build upon that um, with these behavioral graphlets, which allow us to store more state information and do um, a lot of different anal analytics, uh, which we'll talk about um, later on. Um, some of these analytics are, you know, for example, doing things like TTP tagging or you know, doing, doing machine learning uh, based analytics uh, through our, our framework. And we can essentially pass things out uh, through the end of the, uh, the other end of the straw as raw telemetry or alerts or uh, with with a lower frequency uh, lower frequency uh, so just to, to start off with talking about the actual uh, sysflow pipeline itself uh, it really is made up of it's all of this uh, that we're going to talk about today pretty much all in in open source um, 
and uh, you, can, you can see it by going to, to sysflow.io. Um, but it really comes out with, I think we've got about five projects uh, right now. Um, uh, and it starts from the left side of the screen, which is an agent uh, that you can deploy uh, on your, your end hosts. And what it does is it um, uh, sort of hooks into passively into your, your kernel, and it can record all of the, uh, uh, the system calls that your um, processes are making into the container, uh, and then pass that up into user space. Uh, for this, we actually use the, the Falco libs um, library, um, and that's how our sort of connection to the Falco is. Um, but that passes up uh, the very, grand or very granular uh, system calls, uh, which we then have what we call the sysflow collector, uh, which is a project that transforms that, that data into um, sysflow. Uh, from there, um, we can do all sorts of different things with it. We can pass it out raw um, you know, to, a, to an S3 uh, in, in chunks, or uh, we can pass it into another uh, component of, of the framework, which is called uh, the sysflow processor. Um, and the idea behind the sysflow processor is, is that it's really sort of like an edge analytics pipeline, and it's designed for, for people to be able to make sort of multi-threaded um, and chain up uh, custom plugins that they can plug right into, into the processor. And they can, each plugin can do a particular analytic or an aggregation and then pass it on to the next plugin. Um, the, the processor comes with a set of built-in plugins, one of which is actually a policy engine, which can uh, take the streaming sysflow um, and uh, essentially apply a Falco-based, uh, we, we utilize the, the Falco-based language to do um, uh, sysflow enrichment or alerts um, and send those out. Um, we also have a graph engine, uh, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later on, uh, which allows you to uh, create those, those uh, graphlet, uh, behavior graphlets that we talked about. Um, and then also you can create sort of your own analytic plugin. Uh, the processor is built in, in Go um, for performance, um, but you can you know, do any sort of machine learning analytic that you want to do on the edge. If you don't want to do things on the edge, you can also um, pass them out and export them. Uh, and we uh, have different supports for S3, Elastic. Uh, right now we're working on uh, something to be able to store uh, gra these graphs in, inside of something like Druid. Um, there's also um, a set of processing APIs um, uh, and SDKs that allow you to process sysflow um, or, and build graphlets in Python, Go, uh, C, C++. Uh, data is exported in Avro, uh, which allows you to essentially, whatever is your favorite language is, if you like Rust um, or, or whatever, you can build bindings. We have the AVDL for all that um, and, and do it in whatever language you want. Uh, we also uh, have uh, an analytics uh, uh, thing to be able to show um, some of the different things we can do. Um, Fred's gonna show uh, through, through a, a Jupyter uh, web page um, in, in a few slides or later in the talk. So first we'll uh, talk a little bit about the, the Sysflow uh, data format. Um, so if anybody who's familiar with NetFlow, um, the, 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 there's a duality there. Um, so the idea behind NetFlow um, is, is that it's insanely difficult to collect uh, packets and store packets and do analysis on packets for very large networks um, just because of the amount of data that's generated. So there's this idea of NetFlow, uh, which is able to take those packets and create sessions, um, a, a, a session summaries of those packets into something that's much smaller that can, can allow people to do more, more analytics. So that duality is like, with the system calls um, uh, are like essentially like packets in, in a way um, when, we, when we're monitoring them. And we can essentially summarize those um, and getting uh, semantic compression uh, into, into Sysflow. Um, and so basically Sysflow processes uh, control flows, um, file interactions, and network communications. And can, can link those to the processes, but also to the containers uh, and to the pods um, inside of Kubernetes um, that, that you do. So you can create these really nice, uh, you know, sort of graphic um, things for, for analysis. And we'll, we'll show some of those a little bit later on. Uh, so this is the idea of, uh, of an example of Sysflow. Um, Sysflow is really made up of, of two types of objects. One are entities, so things like processes, containers, and files. And entities in this picture are, would be green. Uh, and then you have uh, two other things. One are events uh, or flows. Um, which are here shown in purple. So in this particular case, we have, uh, let's say, a process 1882 or 1822 uh, that uh, is going to clone uh, another process 1823. 
And so that would create a process event, um, and then essentially a, um, would clone a process event. And then we have sort of an exec, um, if let's say the process changes from, from bash to, um, I don't know, ls or something like that, uh, you'd have, you'd have ex the exec. We also have this idea of flows. Uh, and so flows are essentially aggregations or summaries of multiple um, uh, uh, system calls together um, to be able to sort of convey a behavior, like an interaction uh, on the network or reading or writing to a file. And so what they, they can do is they essentially summarize um, a whole bunch of system calls and can record how much data was sent or how many operations were part of a part of the connection. So in this particular case, process 1823 is interacting with the network, um, and so it creates a, a network flow uh, to a particular endpoint. Um, it may um, interact with a file. Maybe this this particular process is uh, is vulnerable and has been exploited. So it's going to drop an S Excel xfill.py file that's going to be written. Uh, later on, it may be executed, and we can sort of see that chain down to, down to the execution. And then maybe it's going to set up, you know, some sort of, you know, uh, communication or uh, command and control thing. So this gives you sort of an idea of kind of that graph-like like function that we'll that we'll take a look at uh, later on. The, uh, this uh, gives sort of another example, um, actually using, we have a bunch of, a set of tools um, that we can use on Sysflow. One of them is called Sysprint, which basically takes the Sysflow file and it is able to uh, put it out in this sort of tabular form or in, in JSON. And so the idea here is we have like a little example of let's say a server communicating with a client. Um, so we get a whole bunch of information about all of the processes that are associated uh, uh, with, uh, with monitoring the system. So we get the, for example, the PID, uh, process ID, the thread ID. Um, each uh, line represents a, a flow or an event. Uh, events will have, um, and, and each uh, event and flow has an operation uh, f flag, uh, which is like, I guess, the, the fourth column. And that describes what the event is or flow is doing. Uh, it's actually a bitmap, um, and so uh, for an event, that bitmap will have one bit set uh, to indicate the operation that it's doing. So for example, in the first line there, you have the exec, which indicates that this, uh, the, exec, uh, the server process was exec, um, and it has a particular time uh, because the event is a, a point in time uh, operation. Um, and then we have uh, you know, some other, other things here, uh, some file flows. Uh, the next two, I think, are file flows. Um, and so they have multiple operations together. Um, and so the O and the C there, are, for example, for opening and closing the ld, uh, ld.os.cache file, um, and there's a time um, range for the start time and end time uh, for that as well. And um, you know, closer to the, to the right there, you can see the container um, ID and various uh, su summary um, uh, uh, statistics about that particular flow. Um, and if we move down to uh, the client, so we've got the client as well. And here is the sort of the expansion of, of a net network flow um, uh, for the client. Uh, the C, W, R, and T indicate uh, that the, uh, uh, the connect a connection was made, the C, uh, there was a, a read and a write on that particular uh, network flow, and then um, the client uh, uh, shut down before it was closed, so we have a T for a truncate. Um, but this gives all of the, uh, the different attributes that we have, source IP, destination IP, and the summary information. Now, um, Syslow is an object relational language, or sorry, a format. So it actually point references uh, to various different things using an object ID. So the flow here points to a, to a process. The process object uh, has its own ID, and then it has a set of uh, uh, attributes that are around it. And then it also has a container uh, that it's associated with. And so we, this is one of the ways that we can further uh, reduce the size of the, of the record. Um, so this is just uh, the, uh, the format. Um, Again, uh, it's an object relational format. You can see the entities. We have the file entity, the process entity, and the container entity. Um, and then essentially, we have different types of flows and events. So we have the process event, uh, the process flow, uh, which stores uh, information about the number of threads created or exited over a time period. Um, the, uh, the file flow, which again, we'll show you those, the, the, the number of files that are the files that have been read and written to um, by the process, and it'll point to a file. Uh, the file event um, is something that is a, a point in time thing, so, so something like 
a directory has been removed, a file has been removed, um, those types of things. Uh, and then we have a, a network flow and a network event. Um, more recently, we've actually added um, to, the, to the right of the screen there, uh, pods and, and, and Kubernetes events. And that's something that just came out um, in the most re recent release uh, of, of, uh, of the project. Um, so just to give an idea a little bit about the uh, reduction um, in, in data that we can get from, from Syslo versus the system calls, um, in a lot of cases we can get over an order of magnitude reduction, um, and it really depends on you know, the process that we use, uh, whether it's uh, you know, databases actually really get really good uh, compression, and then there's certain ones that, uh, uh, like web servers where it's less. Um, but um, overall we get um, over, over uh, an order of magnitude reduction. So, uh, so there we talked about Syslow. Now Syslow, again, it, it does reduce the data, but it's still very stateless. Uh, and so we uh, actually just released uh, this uh, in, in, into open source, this idea of a behavioral graphlet. And so the idea behind a behavioral graphlet um, is a tip, your typical graphlet uh, for, for recording processes um, would, would essentially create a new node for every instance of a process that is uh, being, um, being created. Uh, here, what we do is we actually coalesce those uh, instances into a single particular behavior uh, and, and, and create that as a node. Uh, so for example, um, in our picture here, if those are that are familiar with an Apache web server, an Apache web server typically has a root process. That root process will create a set of worker nodes um, that, uh, that you can see there on, on the far right uh, in the second, the, the second level. Uh, and so what we can do is we, the, these graphlets can sort of recognize that behavioral pattern of those creations and co coalesce those into one um, you know, uh, single node with the underlying instances uh, you know, recorded within that node. Um, and the, the same goes for uh, the, the file flows and the network flows that are associated with that worker process um, and, and can give those, th those, those summarizations. Um, and Fred is actually going to show uh, this uh, uh, in the demo, uh, so you get a really good idea of, of how, the, how these work in, a, in an actual use case scenario. Um, so one of the use cases that we have for the behavioral graphlets, uh, we'll just quickly go through this, um, is the idea of doing, doing rate, mod, uh, uh, rate limiting uh, of system events um, using rate mod modulation. Um, so we do this, uh, for example, for sims uh, that can charge a lot for every event that they collect if they do on a, on a particular thing, um, and also to reduce this idea of event fatigue or alert fatigue that's coming at, it's coming at the user. So the idea here um, is that we have essentially uh, the incoming syslow that comes in, we can generate um, those behavioral graphlets and use that state information to limit uh, the amount of uh, repetition that we send out um, for each, each process tree. Um, so we have a, a set, sketch, set of set sketch filters which allow us to accumulate those repetitive events and then release them out at specific times um, in, in summary. And then we can forward new and unique events um, out um, as we see them, um, utilizing a rate limiting bucket. And this can actually give you know, sort of staggering um, results in terms of event reduction. Uh, so here we have uh, uh, an example of a 12 node worker node K8 cluster, and we can see on the on the left hand side there that with Sysflow we we're generating um, over, within the the 100, 100 minutes we're generating four million events. Um, but when we use the the rate modulation uh, on the on the uh, the far right, we actually only forward you know 27,814 unique events, um, and the other four million uh, 100,000 we can sort of accumulate together and merge and summarize. Uh, and so, um, so we can reduce that down to 44,000 events. And so we don't actually drop any events, but we're accumulating the ones that we're seeing uh, you know, he heavily. And this allows us to drastically reduce the number of events that we're forwarding, and then of course, um, the number of alerts uh, that we send out overall. So I will pass it over to my colleague, Fred, who will go over another use case and also talk and show a demo. Hey everybody, can you hear me? Yep. Cool, so Tara so far presented all these data abstractions that we have built 
to sort of curtail the state explosion, event fatigue, and also help us understand what's going on in those endpoints. And one question that we have asked uh, during our research when we were working um, as part of this uh, DARPA project, for example, was if we could use those abstractions to um, essentially automate uh, the understanding of the different behaviors that we have, for example, in a large Kubernetes cluster, right? So that's uh, basically the use case. And then we thought about maybe, okay, since we have those graphs that are very semantic um, and, and very contextual, can we apply techniques uh, borrowed from graph representation learning to essentially try to see if we can actually identify salient behaviors or perhaps anomalous behaviors that are happening um, in the runtime of a, of, a, of a Kubernetes cluster. So in doing that, um, for those who are familiar with the process of graph representation learning, and more generally machine learning, those um, you know, algorithms for learning, they usually don't take a graph, right? They have to sort of embed those graphs in some sort of vector format. And, and in doing that, you are essentially going through a process of you know, converting data from a very rich and you know, abstract you know, graph form into some sort of a linear sort of vector um, of attributes or features. And that's kind of this low dimension re reduction that you have to, to perform. And um, most of the work that has been done around uh, you know, graph representation learning usually takes um, topology into consideration. So they try to sort of um, vectorize um, the graph and sort of capture the topological aspects of that graph. But it turns out that our system telemetry has lots of semantics that actually carry out, lots of metadata that is carried out within the nodes themselves. As you saw before, those nodes, they capture things like user information, command line information. Um, they have things like the number of uh, bytes and operations that have been, um, that have happened within you know, that session or you know, that file that has been opened and things like that. And that's actually lost if you use an approach that only captures topology. So we researched a few different approaches and one of uh, the good candidates uh, in our research that we have uh, tested is this graph wrapper sort of algorithm that is able to um, basically use a modified kernel for a short path that um, not only captures um, topology information when it vectorizes uh, the graphs, but also uh, supports this idea of node attribute in embedding. So you can um, take things like you know the number of bytes, as you see here in the second line, the number, um, you know, the port numbers that are you know associated with network flows. You can uh, take into consideration the return value, right, of processes. That's actually very indicative of problems. For example, when we have errors as return values, so those are also captured. Uh, the operational flags. The uh, up, um, the, also the open flags that go into act, um, interacting with files, uh, and very importantly, the command lines, right? When you have programs running, that also it's very indicative of, of behaviors. So our approach for embedding takes those two things, both um, topology and node attributes. And then once you have those vectors, each you know, graph basically gets um, embedded into a vector of, of different attributes or features. Um, you basically want to, you know, perhaps apply clustering to those, to that vector space. And, and um, you know, you can have different clustering algorithms that you can apply. In our case, we use some um, unsupervised clustering algorithm that doesn't need, um, you know, knowledge a priori of the number of, of classes, something like DB scan. And what you have is essentially each dot in this low dimensional space. Now it's representing one of those graphs, those system graphs that we have built. And um, what you see here, for example, in step four, what you would expect is that those graphs there, because they're encoding so many behaviors, would like you know, similar behaviors to cluster together and different behaviors to be you know, far apart if the embedding you know, is good and represent representative enough. So in our experimental setup, what I'm gonna be showing here, uh, we considered one Kubernetes cluster that has um, you know, 12 nodes and it was had a, like a heavy workload. That's what actually part of a red teaming exercise that we did at the company where we had um, an external red team that came and did pen testing against this uh, 
web server that had production software in there. And um, it also had automated regression test suites, so you actually have actual meaningful data going on in this cluster. And that was a day of data, so it's about 3.8 gigabytes of sysflow data that was converted here in the uh, right-hand side into 3,500 <coughs> graphs. Uh, which, on average, each of those graphs, and that's the beauty of this kind of behavioral coalescing, counterflowing data flow coalescing that we do, um, they had about, um, for a large Kubernetes cluster, as I'm saying, uh, about 546 nodes on average and 628 edges on average. So they're a pretty small graph for the type of behaviors that we are actually monitoring. And we apply, um, you know, a principal component analysis uh, to basically this, um, this embedding that we created, and we noticed that um, with just two components, we were able to actually capture and retain a lot of information. So we went with that, uh, and we performed like a clustering um, of those those graphs. And the interesting thing is that for this Kubernetes cluster, we recognize like three big clusters. Um, I didn't mention that, but um, those um, each of those graphs they are annotated with the TGP taggings that comes from Sysflow. So Sysflow has this ability to tag individual behaviors with TGPs. So we are able to actually sample those graphs um, or those dots, right, that corresponds to graphs, and then associate them with, you know, low severity or high severity TGPs. And what you notice here on the top right side of this graph is actually a cluster of the high severity sort of graph behaviors that we observed which correspond to the actual pen testing attacks that we were observing. So we actually sample some of those graphs and uh, we observed that EXIF corresponded to uh, the attacks that um, our penetration testing um, were basically executing in this environment. And then when you sample a little bit on the bottom left, those co corresponded to things like the infrastructure services uh, that we had running that Kubernetes service, things like the Kubelet and you know the, the, the different services that uh, Kubernetes um, <coughs> provides. So in general, what we observe is that this is useful to try to understand you know, very large environments when you want to understand where the salient behaviors are, where things are clustering together. This provides you know, good insights. So, so this is one application of machine learning on top of data abstraction. Um, uh, I also have uh, another, um, actually a live demo, where we're gonna show you how those graphs are constructed and the kind of um, sort of contextual profiling that you can perform with those graphs. Um, I put here the link and a QR code for the demo that is you can actually access in Google Collab, which is basically an open source platform where we have our, um, basically this notebook uh, hosted. Um, so I'm gonna shift over here. I'm running it uh, using this um, <coughs> React JS um, sort of PowerPoint, uh, sorry, presentation, but it's all running in Jupyter. Um, <clears throat> so the quick uh, summary of this demo. First, I'm going to do a very quick overview of um, you know some of the CLI tools for Sysflow, and then we're going to go into actually doing this provenance tracking uh, using those graphs um, with Sysflow. So um, as Tara mentioned, Sysflow, um, the Sysflow collector, creates this basically data abstraction, this relational data abstraction. And at the core of the Sysflow collector, this, there is this open source library that we have released called libsysflow. So um, it also allows you to create your own Sysflow collector. If you don't want to use our open source Sysflow collector, you can actually integrate um, you know, a Sysflow consumer directly in your own you know, open source projects, for example, using our libsysflow uh, library. And um, the interesting thing about this library is that it's actually very easy to use. So we actually put a lot of effort in actually making the APIs, um, I guess, consumable. Um, it's in C++, of course, that layer is all in C++. But essentially what you need to do is instantiate, uh, you know, the Sysflow, um, the Sysflow consumer and uh, the driver and then, you know, call run. And there's a number of configurations that you can pass, but in general, the default options work for a, a vanilla system. But um, there is, like, like I said, there is a number of different parameters that you can set for custom systems that use you know, different custom runtimes for, for the containers, if you're collecting Kubernetes information, for example, and, and things like that. <clears throat> so back here, uh, Tara already talked about the specification. Um, and there is a CLI, right? Um, basically, a command language interpreter that you can use to read Sysflow if you want to debug or if you wanted to see what's going on in your data. So essentially, <clears throat> 
um, you can, for example, type uh, sysprint is the number of this is the name of the CLI, and here is a syslog trace that we have previously captured, <clears throat> and you can see here, for example, you know the different sort of information that you have. The T here corresponds to the type, so it's a process event, a file flow, a, um, again a network flow, and so on. This is the command, uh, the name of the program server client. Um, there are no arguments passed to this program in this case and so on, right? And if you want to know all the attributes that are actually captured uh, in Syslow, like a quick um, way of finding that out is to call sysprint minus L. And this will actually give you, you know, essentially uh, a list of, of all the different attributes that, um, you know, you can actually read from a Syslow trace. So there are, you know, process attributes, as you see here, including user ID, command line, um, you know, if it is interactive, TTY or not. Uh, the environment variables, which is very useful, we're gonna sh you're gonna see in the demo. Also file information, attributes and metadata, network metadata, and, and so on, right? Kubernetes metadata and so on. So back here, um, like how do we build those provenance graphs that we're talking about here, right? So <clears throat> um, one thing before we start, we talk about that. It's a slow, like I mentioned, support uh, TTP tagging. So basically enrichment or decoration of those uh, sysflow records and graphs. Um, so here is basically an example rule, right? It's a declarative rule where essentially you give it a name and then you have a condition. That's the main part of the rule. And the condition is a basic logical condition that's gonna match and if it is matched, then you get this basically tag that is added to that uh, node or that record. Um, and um, the first example here uses the shell shock uh, attack against the Apache web server that is in CGI mode using a vulnerable bash. Um, for those who remember, shell shock was a very nefarious vulnerability because it allowed um, attackers to actually gain remote, remote control against web servers that operate in CGI, the common gate, gateway interface. And it, all you need to do really to exploit shell shock was to craft a HTTP request that injected uh, a little payload like this, a declared uh, empty function, and then followed by you know the command that you want to execute on against the remote server uh, by basically setting that HTTP user agent. So very easy to actually um, pull off and exploit. And um, here we have basically done um, a sysflow, basically a shell shock attack against a server that was monitored against um, sys, uh, uh, monitored by sysflow, and um, just to show you how simple it is to use and our APIs, here you have essentially all you need to do is basically call this graphlet, construct this graphlet. Uh, here we're using our Python APIs. So you pass into this graphlet the data. Uh, we can also um, read directly from database, but here we're passing the, the data trace. And uh, we also pass in the definitions of a YAML file that contains the TTP rules that I was showing, that I was just talking about. So once you construct this graph, then you, call, you can call into view, passing different attributes here, and you get this basically graph object here, right? So um, let me um, reduce here. Let me see if I can do that. I can do that. So yeah, so again, what Tara was showing before, right? You have the Apache web server that is operated in um, basically CGI mode. Um, here you have the exact, the, the, the exact that happens from the vulnerable CGI mode. So essentially the attacker was able to inject an HTTP variable and dupe uh, this process into calling an interactive shell. And you see here that you get the labels, like the TTP labels for this kind of behavior, for control flow hijacking. Um, you know, these nodes encode lots of data, lots of information, like such as the user, the user ID, the group, group ID, TTY, and things like that. And eventually, what you can see by following this graph is that um, the attacker, through that interactive or reverse shell, you know, calls a cat into its extra password, which contains basically an enumeration of users, so you can actually see the file flow in which tells that that, you know, et cetera, password was actually accessed. All right, so this is one thing, but we can do more, right? This is one interesting way of understanding, quickly understanding what's going on in that system. Um, but one interesting thing is that I mentioned, right, this will also capture the environment variables. So we can actually look at one of the nodes, the nodes where there is that exec that calls into the bash, um, and we can just expose two attributes of you know, that node, the, the executable name and uh, um, the environment variables. And what you see here is that here is actually the CGI binary that is being 
um, injected with that malicious payload. And what you see here is the exact payload that the attacker used. So you see here the user agent. So there's the, that empty function. And um, there is actually the beam bash minus I that is actually being piped into the TCP socket for the remote uh, server that the attacker controls. So that's essentially the simple payload that is injected and Syslow gives you visibility all the way to that payload. Um, so other things that you can do, of course, you can traverse, do graph traversal. So you can actually enumerate queue chains by just traversing the graph. So if you do like Apache.tt, uh, sorry, that Apache is the name of the graph that I just constructed and call into TTPs, then you can actually have a partial ordering, like an ordering of the different uh, TTPs that happen, right? From the abuse of the native API, the Zec API, to hijacking of the execution, to the account discovery. So you start to have actually adding semantics to those behaviors by connecting to Mitre which basically has this ontology of different um, known tactics, techniques, and procedures. So this is useful as well. So without any analysis, I can just build the graph from any data, like this flow data, and then call into these TTPs and you have an enumeration of, of you know, potentially malicious behaviors. Um, you can recover the data from those TTPs as well, like I'm showing here. So those are the specific records that are associated with those tags. So that's a very useful when you're like Neo in the haystack sort of searches. Um, you can also, given a graph that has been annotated with TTPs, you can call into the mitigations function which actually connect to the Mitre via CTI and actually give you potential mitigations that you can deploy against that particular um, set of TTPs, right? And you can expand those um, by calling associated mitigation. So it, it's gonna actually map what type of mitigations you could be deploying your environment to mitigate those different types of, of attacks. And this is, again, all borrowing from this infrastructure, this knowledge base that you have uh, from MITRE. You can also uh, connect to MITRE Defend, which you know, gives you other types of mitigations. Um, and now, talking about a use case, uh, like a larger use case against a Kubernetes cluster, um, I'll try to go quickly through this use case, but essentially it's a supply chain attack that where, you know, uh, this user was duped into basically installed some piece of malware. Uh, this client server, this sorry, this client has access to a production server um, where you have your Kubernetes cluster and you have um, applications running. And essentially, it basically dupes this client into installing a package.json that is malicious. So it gets pushed into that server, gets deployed via CI/CD, and you have Sysflow monitoring the server. So we're going to be analyzing the behaviors that happens in this server, and that actually this attack lends to you know, an exfiltration to a Twitter API. So we're gonna be analyzing that behavior through the lens uh, of you know, Sysflow monitoring. So first thing we do here, uh, that's the data, right? Uh, it's in this directory here, uh, open um, <coughs> source summit. And we have, and oh, again, you can actually run those things in your own leisure by um, accessing the Collab environment. But this is the TTP's uh, YAML. Again, the same TTP's YAML that I used before. It's also publicly available. Uh, and you uh, construct the graph. And when you get, uh, when you call that TTP's function, the first thing you wanna basically take a sneak peek on is um, you know, what are the potentially you know, known TTP's that this data contains, and actually contains a lot of them. So there's something interesting going on in the server, right? Um, <clears throat> And bear in mind, this in, you know, is a data collection for you know, of many, many several minutes, but we can quickly tell what's going on without actually going into the underlying data, and we, this is useful. Um, and um, here, we're gonna get the first TTP and actually give me the data that is baking or backing that TTP. And that's the data, right? So that, let's take a look very quickly here. That's a process event, so it's an execution of a process. I don't care about the PIDs right now, but I, I care about the process that is being executed. And it's an S copy project process. So there's an S copy happening in a Kubernetes environment. That's of interest. I want to know what this remote copy program is doing. What is it copying to? Um, so it's copying something into this folder, and I want to know what it's doing. So how do I do that? So essentially, I can create another graph using the same data, but now I have this indicator of compromise. I know that S copy was executed. So I will basically use this little expression language here that I can actually express that. I can say, hey, give me the, uh, you know, the, the graph that corresponds to the process that whose um, command line contains this S copy program. And lo and behold, you actually got that node, right? There is this process being executed. You actually know its parent. That's the nice thing about provenance tracking. 
you can actually quickly relate to parents and you know the things, the resources that is being interacted with. So here you know that it's being you know invoked by SSG. But most importantly, let me let me show here in the bottom, you have this um, um, you have this this file here is is of interest. So it's actually dumping or copying this um, package.json file. And for those who know, package.json is the file description for uh, packages that usually goes into Node.js. So now I have, you know, through my knowledge, right, my domain knowledge of this, I, I, I want to know, okay, is there any process descending from Node in this machine? So that's my second indicator of compromise. I'm going to build another graph from the same data, but now projecting over this query here. And again, you see most of the TTPs associated with this node, this um, Kubernetes cluster, are actually um, associated with the behaviors that is spawning from Node.js. So we are getting closer to narrowing down where those TTPs are coming from. So let's move forward here. So uh, again, those are the records that are um, underlying those TTPs, are backing those TTPs, and they are actually being spawned by, by Node, and you have WGATs going on there. Um, so I'm going to skip over this one. Again, you can see, you can actually trace the behaviors that are going. So you, you have like a wget going on there. You have a chmod. You have lots of things going on in there. <clears throat> and here, uh, that's, I think, the thing that I want to show you. If I build the graph using essentially that IOC, right, I want to see uh, all the descendants or all processes whose descendants contain node, uh, and ho whose PID is in the set of the PIDs that I have uh, associated with that particular behavior, you actually get, get a graph like this. And you see, on the top, you have your node application with benign, is the production application that is running on that uh, Kubernetes host. It's containerized. Um, but eventually, what you get is actually the attack that CVE uh, allows for remote code execution. So you get this basically shell that is spawned by node, which is a typical, um, which is calling to a netcat that is, you know, piping back uh, into a reverse shell to the remote client that, that is controlled by, by the, the remote server that is controlled by the attacker. And from there on, you actually have a chain of events that calls into bash. And the interesting thing is that you can actually this is all like temporally ordered. So you have, you know, for example, here in the bottom, you have the, a wget. So the attacker is doing a wget. So downloading a script called tweet inside that machine or that container. And then it chmods that uh, script to be executable, right? So that's the chmod here that is going on. After that, it actually executes the tweet uh, script. So it's actually running it. Um, and you see that by the Zach here. Um, and then it removes it. Right, it has to erase its traces. So that's the chain of events that you can tell by just creating this graph. So now you know what the attack queue chain kind of looks like. Now you want to know also perhaps the impact of this um, in terms of what has actually done, has it actually moved data around and things like that. So that's the other thing you can do, right? So you can, um, because this flow is relational, so it's not, not only capture process control flows, but also interactions with the network and the file system. You can say, hey, now that I know that tweet was executed, let me look at this indicator of behavior or compromise. So the process containing tweet in the name, and I want to also see all the file flows and network flows whose flows are you know, greater than zero associated with tweet. And here you get you know, basically the tweet process. Again, I didn't change the data, all the same data. I'm just projecting over the data into different ways. And here I see the tweet process that is actually reading a lot of things from the file system and also doing a lot of things in the network. And we're getting close to the end here. So very interesting. So what, what I want to show you is basically I'm, I'm projecting into this node here. You see the node ID of the graph. So I'm going to say, hey, give me a plot in time of egress and egress traffic for the network flow. And Lo and behold, what you see here is a lot of, you know, sort of command and control. So you see like information coming in back and forth from that tweet um, script, but also lots of information being written out, sent out to the network by that tweet. So something is being moved out of the cluster. So that's, that's interesting. And how is that being moved out of the cluster? And that's, that's what we can do also with this. So you can actually switch uh, and basically build those flow diagrams using the same data again. Um, 
but, uh, and show specifically, for example, that's an interesting thing about capturing lots of metadata. You can see that from 165, which is the IP of our object storage, we know that um, th those dark green um, flows are the flows that contain lots of data moving. Um, we can see that the flow is going from this all the way passing through our Node.js um, container and flowing through those 104, uh, 104 uh, IPs which belong to the Twitter API. So here you see that indeed there was like a flow of information that exfiltration going on uh, through the network. So yeah, so that's pretty much uh, I think uh, what we have uh, to say here. Um, I think we can um, pause for, for questions. <clears throat> Yes. Have you uh, considered Rust instead of C++ uh, when to, to write it? Uh, just out of curiosity. <laughs> um, we we have. Uh, uh, I think it 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 probably on the back the backlog. It's not like a you know uh, there. Are, I think there are advantages to going going with Rust, yeah. and especially in terms of you know simplifying some of the code down and, and stuff like that. And safety. So it's, yeah. Yeah. And safety. So at some point, yeah, we'll probably look at it. It's just yeah. we want they to get more they, features in, in before sort of going back. And yeah, the, the stack that we build upon today is also all C++. So okay. if you look at the Falco leads, it's all written in C++ Right, as well. that makes sense. Yeah, but as the kernel modernizes and, yeah. you know, and things, um, yeah, we, we'll consider. So second question. Um, so taking the system and kind of framework and graphless and everything, is it possible to uh, use different types of records from different domain, like application observability, like uh, using this graph to um, kind of uh, visualize the stack trace or mm. a business event, the credit card transactions, yes. and stuff like that? Is that like possible? Have you thought about it? Is it, it yes, we, yeah, in principle, yes. Like okay. anything that has yeah, you know, but yeah, anything that has control and data flow sort of dependencies, yeah. In principle, you could use the same sort of algorithms that we use to build. Uh, those graphs based on system calls, right? On sysflow, right, right, right. you could apply them to other domains for sure. And right. is that like what? It's an Apache license? Or? It's all Apache too. Yeah. Right. So, okay. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. yeah we also uh, the processor itself um, is designed. To, uh, we did get into it uh, mm -hmm. in this one, but it's designed to, to allow you to write different drivers. So you could take in data, different data sources. Yeah. You can combine them together. Um, it comes right now with the Cislo, the Cislo driver, but um, you can do other other types of things. Like we're, we're actually one of the things we're playing around with right now is enriching Cislo with other data sources. So you could do that also with different, yeah, different it, completely. You, different you're not bound to the Cislo as your input. You can actually build drivers to other data sources, essentially, uh, that for that telemetry pipeline that you saw. They, they left uh, the sessions for the last. I mean, I don't like it. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. We also have oh, limited, yeah. limited editions. We have, I don't know yeah, this is the remaining survivals. Yeah, it's the, how can I say that? It's the limited first edition of our, you know, little logo. So, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, 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 one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, we, we may have some. <laughs> um, and, and like I say, we, we're um, on, we have a Slack for the, for the Cisco community. So if you go to cisflo.io, you'll, you'll see that. Uh, yeah. We're also, well, also people that, like to use uh, Falco, we're also there, there. So if you want to come say hello, uh, want to collaborate, uh, yeah, have questions, anything we're like that. We're both in the Kubernetes um, workspace in Slack. If you go to Falco, you will find us. Um, and also there is a, if you go to the sysflow.io, there is a invite, invitation link for our workspace, a community workspace in Slack, and also reach out to us in there. So both project. All right.